Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you, my Father. Oh, Father, what a privilege and an honor it is to be able to serve you, my Father. What a privilege and an honor it is to be able to be called children of the Most High. Father, I just want to thank you. I thank you for that which you are doing in our lives. I thank you, Abba Yahuwah, for the fact that you come and that you are the one that goes before us and you are the one that leads us by the hand. Father, I thank you that when you speak a word, it shall surely come to pass. And that which we need to understand is that we are not to be able to do things of our flesh. We are to wait on you. We are to trust you. We are to surrender to you. We are to allow you to be the one to be able to do what needs to be done. Oh, Father, I thank you for the lessons that we can learn from our scriptures, Father. I thank you for the lessons that the scriptures speak I thank you for the patriarchs and I thank you for the matriarchs in this Bible that teach us the ways that we need to walk. And we see their errors and we see their, their faults and we see where they stumble and where they fall and we see their victories and we see where they conquer and we see where you lift them up and we see where they fall because of where they themselves are just human as we are. And that is why it's so important for us to be able to read our foundational covenant. Because if we do not read our foundational covenant, then we cannot be able to identify with those that was our fathers, the fathers of our faith. We cannot identify with Abraham, Isaac and Yaakov. We cannot identify and therefore, we do not have an understanding of Torah. We do not have an understanding of a foundation. We do not have an understanding of a covenant. But when we start to read through the pages of your covenant, Father, we understand. We understand where we ourselves can learn lessons to be able to not make the same mistakes that they did. And why are these things here? Why is the Bible there? The Bible being your basic instruction before we're going to leave earth. So that we understand that we have instructions. And that is what Torah is. Torah is not a set of laws. It is instructions. It is instructions to be able to teach us how to be set apart and walk with you. It was never meant to be able to be interpreted as law, but it was to be able to be interpreted as an instruction for us to be able to learn what is pleasing to you, what is not pleasing to you. What is it that we can learn from this book of Genesis? where we understand the fathers of our faith. It's easy to be able to say, Abraham is my father. He's the father of the covenant. He's the father of faith. But do we really understand the walk of Abraham? Do we really understand the walk of Isaac? Do we really understand the walk of Jacob? Because at the end of the day, in order for us to be able to walk out this walk of faith, we need to be able to walk it out, being set apart unto you. And this is not about just a, it's not about just another scripture. This is about being able to understand that these are principles that is to teach us and that is to guide us. And that is to lead us. That is why the Torah is our instructor. It's a tutor. It's an instruct. It instructs us. It tutors us. It teaches us in the ways to walk with you, Father. And so I thank you, my Father. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the richness of your word. I thank you, Father, that the more... I read this word, the more I understand your heartbeat and I understand the sorrow of your heart 
because we are so far from what you desire for our lives. And so I thank you, Father. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that you give us grace and mercy, Father, to be able to be those that will walk with you, to be able to be those that will be led and guided by you. And so I thank you for this lesson tonight, Father. I thank you that you will open up our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears for us to understand the depths of what it is that you want to reveal to us. As last week, we had to understand that we got to dig deep. Those wells needed to be dug in order to let the water flow. And we are needing to go deep to allow the water of the wells to flow. And so I thank you, Father. I thank you for this lesson tonight that you will open up our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears to be able to be led and guided by you through the pages of this Bible and as we have the Torah being unfolded to us chapter by chapter. I praise you and I thank you for this in Yahushua's name. Amen. Amen. Praise our Father. So tonight we are going to be able to look at chapter 27 but let us quickly just recap a little bit about chapter 26 and what did we read last week. We understood once again that there is famine, scarcity of food in the land and that Jacob is going to go to Gerer, which is to the land of Abimelech and it's the king of the Philistines. And the father didn't want Isaac to be able to go into Mitzrayim, just like his father in Genesis chapter 20 verses 1 went into Mitzrayim. He had to land up staying in the land of Canaan. He cannot go back. He cannot go back into this. Um, he cannot go back into the land of Egypt, which is where he came from, the, the land of the Chaldeans. He's not to go back. He's to be able to go forward. And this is what we need to understand. We need to go forward with the Father. Father has got a highway of holiness that he's wanting us to be able to walk on. And what we mustn't do is go back into Egypt in order to be able to find our sustenance in Egypt. We are to understand that the Father gives us sustenance on our journey as we go. Even in the time of famine, we are not to resort back to the ways of Egypt, which is what many, many are falling again for the ways of Egypt, which they have been delivered from. And so we see that in Genesis chapter 26, verses 3, Father reinstates the covenant with Isaac. He's reinstating it. In verses 5, we see the law that was already established because this was very important that we needed to understand that he's reinstating the covenant with Isaac. But in verses, in verses 5, he turns around and he says to him that, he says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice, guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. And so this is what we need to understand. Many people have this understanding that the law was only given to Moses. And it was from the time of Moses that the law came about. That is not correct. The law was already given from the time of Noah when he came off the ark. And so it's been passed down. And so when the father appears to Abraham, he teaches Abraham his commands, his charge, and his Torah, and his ways of doing things. He has an intimate relationship with Abraham, and he's teaching him, and he's leading him, and he's guiding him, and he's teaching him his ways. And you see, so there's no one that can come into complete intimacy with the Father, that the Father's not going to bring them back into the 
the covenant that has been made from the beginning because if you are intimate with the Father and you truly make that relationship to be intimate with Him, He will bring you back to that which has been lost. And so this is what we see. And then we see that in verse 7 here we see the sin of Abraham transfers to Isaac. And what sin is this? Isaac now lies and turns around and says that Rebekah is his sister and not his wife because just like his father, he is scared that he's going to be killed because Rebekah was a beautiful woman. Now understand, the father has just given him the, the promise of the covenant. He's just told him that he's going to be able to bless him and that he will give him lands and that he will give him his seed and that his seed will inherit the land. But yeah, we see him going into a time of um, fear and through fear, just like his father, the sins of the fathers pass down to the children. And so we are going to see history repeat itself. And then we see that from verses 12 to 15, we see here how Abba blesses Isaac to show the nations around him that he's great. And you see, when the Father starts to bless you, those around you will see the hand of the Father upon your life and they will see the blessing of the Father. When Abba starts to bless you, those around will be jealous and they might even send you out of their camp and out of their fellowship. <laughs> because this is exactly what happened to Isaac. He was then thrown out of the camp of Abimelech because now he became too great. And now they start to feel threatened. So isn't it amazing that in some fellowships when they feel threatened by you, then they are coming up against you because they feel threatened. And we saw as well the covenant that was reinstated by chapter, verse 24 and 25. We see the covenant being reinstated with Isaac to encourage him that even if his enemies are going to be those that are going to be around him, we are to understand that these enemies cannot stand against the one whom Abba Yahuwah has blessed. And so we had a look and we saw that all the striving that was going on was about the, the wells, the water is ours, and it was a striving that was going on about the wells. And in verse 24, Yahuwah appears to him in the same night and says, I am the allure of your father Abraham, do not fear, for I am with, the, with, I am with you and shall bless you and increase your seed. For my servant Abraham's sake. And he built a slaughter place there and called on the name of Yahuwah. Interesting. He goes, he's striving, he builds the he 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 gets the first well, it's taken, he gets another well, and again the striving continues. Then the father appears to him, and then he builds a slaughter place. And in that slaughter place he does what his father Abraham has done. He goes and he builds an altar for the Father, an altar of worship. You see, we need to build an altar of worship. Is our lives a life that is surrendered, submitted of worship unto the Father? And he builds a slaughter place there and called on the name of Yahuwah. So you see, everything about our lives needs to reflect the character of Yahuwah, the one whom we worship, because those nations around us, the people around us, need to see that the Yahuwah that we serve is a Yah of greatness, a Yah that is worthy to be praised, and we honor him and we worship him. And Abimelech came and Yitzhak said to them in verse 27, Why have you come to me, seeing you have hated me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We clearly see that Yahuwah is with you. And we have said, Please, let there be an oath between us, between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you. That you, 
that you do not that you do no evil to us as we have not touched you as we have done only good towards you and have sent you away in peace you are now blessed by Yahuwah and then what comes from here it says and he made the feast and then it says and on the same day it came to be that the servants of Yitzhak in verses 32 came and informed him about the well which they had dug and said to him we have found water. So you see, as we build that altar for the Father, an altar of worship, the wells of living water is going to flow. We need to dig deep to be able to go deep, to have those wells that need to be able to flow. As we come and as we build our altar for Abba Yahuwah, our lives need to be able to worship Him. Remember, it's not just about worship in terms of worship but everything about our lives needs to worship the king everything about who we are needs to be able to bring glory and honor to the king and so tonight we continue with our story in chapter 27 as we now are going to look at this chapter in detail to understand this because sure there's many ways that we can look at this chapter and it came to be when Yitzhak was old and his eyes were dim. So by this time he's battling to see. And he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. And he said, See now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your weapons and your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt wild game for me. And make me a tasty dish, such as I love, and bring it to me to eat, in order that I'm, my being does bless you before I die. Now you see, once again, we see something interesting here, because, see, Isaac has this fascination for Jacob, um, Isaac has this fascination for Esau, even though he knows that this son of his is a son that is not serving the ways of the father. But all he requires is he requires him to be able to keep giving him what his flesh lusts for, this wild game. Understand something. They have sheep. They have goats. They have these animals. Why does Esau have to go and hunt wild game? So you see, Isaac has a taste now for this wild game. And he desires this. And because of this, all of a sudden, Esau has become his favorite son. Was he favorite son because of his obedience to the ways of the father? No. He becomes a favorite son because of the fact that um, he becomes a favorite son because of the fact that he gives him a lust to his flesh, something that his other son is not going to give. Yet his other son, from growing up, desires the courts of the father, desires to dwell with Abba Yahuwah, and desires to be able to follow in the footsteps of, of that which has been passed down from Abraham to Isaac and now to Jacob to be able to serve Abba Yahuwah. But yet, we see that this Esau is very different. He's a wild man who wants the ways of the world, who wants to be a hunter. So, <coughs> In verse 5 it says, And Rivka heard when Yitzhak spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt wild game and to bring it. And Rivka spoke to Yaakov, her son, saying, See, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, So, bring me wild game and make me a tasty dish to eat and bless you in the presence of Yahuwah before my death. And now, my son, listen to my voice according to what I command you. Now, understand, Jacob loves his mother. 
Jacob loves his father. Jacob is a man that has been brought up by, by the ways of the father. And now Rebekah is going to come to him and require something of him. Please go to the flock and bring two choice young goats and I make a tasty dish from them for your father, such as he loves. And you shall take it to your father and he shall eat it so that he might bless you before his death. And Yaakov said to Rebekah, his mother, See, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. What if my father touches me? Then I shall be like a deceiver in his eyes and shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Now, you know, this was a big thing that has been spoken of here because there is two ways that we can really look at this chapter 27. At the end of the day, if we go back and we have a look at Genesis chapter 25 verses 23, we can say Rebecca is um, acting out of a way that would bring, be, to bring, bring about what the Father has already spoken. Because if we go and look and see in chapter 25 verses 22 and 23, and within her the children struggled together and she said, if all is right, why am I this way? So she went to ask Yahuwah, and Yahuwah said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples shall be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older serve the younger. So this is what the Father shows her. This is what the Father says to her. Now I need you to understand something today and this is something that we're going to need to understand because like I said, there is two ways of us looking at this chapter. We can look at this chapter in the way of being able to say but Rivka, Rebecca, was really acting on behalf of the Father knowing, understand, this is a mother. This is a mother that sees that the, the son, the eldest son, is a man of the flesh. He is a hunter. He has no regard for the ways of the father. He has no regard for what the father is wanting to be able to have. He didn't want to dwell in the courts of the father. He saw that this man was not a man that was going to be able to walk in the footsteps to be able to bring an inheritance down, to be able to have an inheritance being passed down as a blessed inheritance. And besides, the father has spoken to and said to her, the older will serve the younger. So Rebecca understands the future that is at stake here. She has seen that Esau despised his own birthright. He was a hunter a man of the flesh, a man led by his impulses and by his desires, by going to take two women that are Hittites. And she despised this. And the fact that she sees that the son of hers is a son that is being led by his flesh. He has no regard for wanting to be able to serve the father. And she knew what Abba had said about the older would serve the younger. But at the end of the day, was she really acting out of trust for the father, but out of desperation again to bring to pass the promise of Abba? We need to trust the father. If he has spoken, he will do it. She knows that Jacob is the heir to the inheritance. She knows that because the father has told her that. She knows that her husband is being led by his flesh and she wants to make sure that Jacob gets what is rightfully his. But understand something. We must understand that at the end of the day, Father has already spoken. And if the Father has spoken and said, the older will serve the younger, then he's the one that's going to bring it to pass. 
Now you see, we see again a bit of history repeat itself of here when it came to not exactly the same circumstance, but was it not again just like um, Sarah that went to Abraham and said, why don't you take my servant and go and have a child with him so that you can have an inheritance? Now, Rebecca, on the other hand, wants to make sure that she is the one that's going to bring to pass that which the Father has spoken. Now, how many of us in our lives will do that? How many of us have got prophetic word in our lives and then we take it upon ourselves to be able to bring about that prophetic word? And we must understand something. Father, if Father speaks something, Father knows how to bring it about. All he needs you to do is to surrender to him. Wait on him. And this is something that we do not know how to do. We do not know how to wait on him. We are impulsive. And we want to bring about that which the Father has spoken. And this is why so many people go astray. So many people go astray because now there's a prophetic word on your life. And now you, out of your flesh, want to bring about the prophetic word. And there is a danger in this. And this is exactly what it says of here in verses 12 when he says, What if my father touches me? Then I shall be like a deceiver in his eyes and shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Did he not think that at the end of the day his father is going to know about it anyway when Esau comes back. The father is going to know that he has deceived him. So did that thought not cross his mind? All he's thinking is that when he touches me, he's going to see that I've deceived him. But at the end of the day, didn't he think that by the time Esau was going to come back, that his father would have seen that he would have deceived him? So you see, something that we can do that looks good in the eyes of the Father can be bad. Something that we think might be right because the Father has spoken it, we will take matters into our own hands. Now there's many people that, are, that fall. You must understand deception is deception. You cannot bring a lie and make it good. You cannot bring something that's deceiving and make it good. You cannot do that because what happened from the beginning? From the beginning, Hasatan is the father of lies. Hasatan deceived Eve and the father is not into deception. The father doesn't want to bring about deceptive things in order to fulfill his plan. Why should he go about doing a deceptive thing to bring about his plan. If he has spoken something, it will be what it will be without you having to do anything. But you see, we are all flesh beings and we will take matters into our own hands. But the mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. So you see, she's prepared to take the curse on herself which she does take that curse because by what she does, what happens? This blessed child of hers is going to have to leave the camp. He's going to have to flee for his life because his brother's going to want to kill him. She is going to be able to be a mother that is going to grow up now, going to grow old without seeing her, her younger son again and this younger son is going to bear children, but she's going to be deprived of this. Imagine, imagine if this went a different way. You will understand tonight that Jacob was already going to be in line to get that inheritance. Remember, he already received his brother's inheritance. And this was not necessary. Because we must remember, Esau despised his birthright and he gave it to Jacob 
So if he gave the birthright to Jacob, Jacob was already going to walk in the blessing because he got the double portion blessing. And you will understand this tonight as it unfolds for us. So was it really necessary for this to be done? The father could have blessed Esau, just like father, our Abba Yahuwah, even though <coughs> um, Hagar left with Ishmael, and even though Ishmael was birthed of the flesh, there was still a blessing for Ishmael. He still blessed Ishmael, but now there's no blessing for Esau, no blessing at all. <clears throat> so he went uh, he went and fetched them and brought them to his mother and his mother made a tasty dish such as his father loved and Rivka took the best garments of her oldest son Esau which were with her in the house and put them on Yaakov her younger son and she put the skins of the young goats on the hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the tasty dish and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Yaakov. And he went to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? See, now Isaac is asking him, Who are you? And Yaakov said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Now, is that not a blatant lie? So do we justify ourselves that we can lie to further the cause? Do you really think the Father needs us to lie to further his cause? Do you honestly believe? Because if that is what we believe, then we are deceived. Because the Father does not need to work through deception in order to further his cause. The Father has many ways of doing things without our help. He's the creator of the universe. If he has spoken something, he shall surely do it. And this is one of the things that Rivka was to have to have understood. Just like her, her mother-in-law, she should have known Sarah had made a mistake by birthing Ishmael. Now, she too was going to take it upon herself to be able to say, well, we need to bring the work of the Father to pass. And Yaakov said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you said to me. Please rise, sit, eat of my wild game, so that your being might bless me. You see, to what lengths are we prepared to go in order to get the Father's blessing? To what lengths are we prepared to go in order to be able to go about a deceptive thing to receive the Father's blessing? Do you think we need to be deceptive in order to receive the Father's blessing? The Father has already spoken to Abraham. The Father has already spoken to, to, to Isaac. The Father has already spoken to Rebekah and said, the older will serve the younger. He's already received. Remember, there wasn't, he didn't deceive his brother out of his birthright. He offered him a plate of soup and said, well, fine, a plate of lentil a stew and said to him, right, give me your birthright and then I will give you some of this. His brother had a choice. In this matter, his brother had no choice. And that's what we must understand. His brother had a choice. Esau had a choice. He had a choice to say, not a chance. I'm not going to give you my birthright. Are you mad? Why should I give you my birthright? Then keep your meal. Because he had a love for his birthright. But in this case, we see a different scenario. We see he's not been given a choice here. The choice has been taken away from Esau here. And Yitzhak said to his son, so, sorry, Yaakov went near to Yitzhak. Um, <clears throat> then Yitzhak said to Yaakov, please come near so that I can feel you, my son, whether you truly are my son Esau or not. And Yaakov went near to Yitzhak, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy, 
like his brother Esau's hands, and he blessed him. And he said, Are you truly my son Esau? And he said, I am. There he gets given a second time, a second chance, a second chance to make right what he's done wrong. He gets given a second chance to say, Are you really my son Esau? Now, Jacob had the opportunity to say, My father, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry. But again, he says, I am. Now, understand something. You know, like I said, many people can read this account and say, yes, but you know what? Rebecca had been given the promise. Rebecca's only acting on what the father would have wanted. The father, if we are going to see the story like this, then we are going to put the father in a light that is not to reflect him. Our father is not deceptive. Our father doesn't need to go about doing deceptive things in order to further his cause. He doesn't need to do it like that. The father knows how to bless us without us having to go about being deceptive. And this is what we need to understand in the days ahead. What are we going to fall for? What are we going to fall for? Remember, Yeshua was tempted by the enemy three times. He said, why don't you turn these stones into bread? You are hungry. Turn it into bread. Didn't he say to him, why don't you throw yourself off here? Throw yourself off this mountain. Come, let the angels catch you. And then the third time he said, why don't you bow down and I give you all these things? So you know what? In our lives, in the days ahead, there's going to be many things that can present itself to us. Maybe hmm, there's things that can come to be able to say, well, maybe we can get one of these cards, you know, a green card, so that we can further the cause of what we want to do. But is that really going to be a truthful thing or is it a lie? See, it depends on how you justify it. Because at the end of the day, no blessing can come from a lie. What blessing is going to come from a lie? And you see, if we were to read the story and leave it where it is, we could see that Rivka was really working on behalf of her son. But unfortunately, we continue to read the, the story ahead. And as we're going to get ahead, we are going to see that Jacob is going to get double for his trouble. Jacob is going to be deceived by his own father-in-law. Because what you sow is what you're going to reap. And that's what we've got to understand. He himself said, this deceiving, I will become a deceiver in the eyes of my father. And this is what we need to understand. That's why the father's going to need to change his name. Because his name did not carry the blessing that was to be able to come forth because there was a deception that had come, that had come in that the father did not want. And there was going to have to be restitution that was going to have to take place. And Jacob went, and so <clears throat> it says in verse 25, and he said, bring it near to me and let me eat of my son's wild game so that my being might bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate. And he brought his wine, and he drank. And his father Yitzhak said to him, Please come near and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelt the smell of his garments, and he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Yahuwah has blessed. So you see, he's now smelling Esau, because Esau was the the firstborn, and there was a blessing. There was a blessing that he was to have. Was it to say <clears throat> that Jacob wasn't going to get a blessing? His father could have still blessed Jacob, blessed him in a different way. And Alua gave to you, and Alua give to you of the dew of the heavens, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Now, interesting, this of you is all blessing, but is it really the blessing that was spoken to Isaac that you are going to multiply, that you are going to increase, that you are, I'm going to give you the nations, 
I'm going to give you all of this. These are the blessings that has been spoken to to um, to um, Isaac every single time when the blessings is being spoken. It's saying um, that he's going to be able to bless him and increase his seed. So look at what he says. All the time he says, Sojourn in the land and I shall be with you and bless you for I give all these lands to you and your seed and I shall establish the oath which I swore to Abraham your father and I shall increase your seed like the stars of the heavens and I shall give all these lands to your seed and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Those was always the blessing but now understand He's telling him he's going to get the fatness of the earth and the plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brother and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those cursing you and blessed be those blessing you. So this is the blessing that gets declared over Jacob and at the end of the day this is the blessing that's going to pass down. It is the blessing that has come passed down. And it came to be as soon as Yitzhak had finished blessing Yaakov, and Yaakov had hardly left the presence of Yitzhak, his father that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting, and he too had made a tasty dish and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father rise and eat of his son's wild game so that your being might bless me. And his father Yitzhak said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Yitzhak trembled exceedingly and said, Who was it then who hunted wild game and brought it to me? And I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him. Yes, he is blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me too. Oh, my father, you see, we see here, he, he, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. So you see a bitterness of spirit now upon Esau, because now his brother has really now deceived him. The other one, he gave it away. Now we need to understand the difference between, you see here, a desperate Esau, you know, he's now crying. And now listen to what he says. Um, he says, when Esau heard the words of his father, and he says, and I, I, I have blessed him. Yes, he is blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly, bless me too, O father. And he said, your brother came with deceit and took your blessing. You see, so what did he speak? And he says, remember what he spoke in verse 12. What if my father touches me? Then I shall be like a deceiver in his eyes and shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. So we see that now he's saying, your brother has come and deceived me. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Yitzhak answered and said to Esau, See, I have made him your master, and all his brothers I have given to him as servants, and all his brothers I have given to him as servants, and I have sustained him with grain and wine, and what then shall I do for you, my son? So, yeah, we see a de de desperate Esau. Do we just come to Abba? Now we must understand something. The father showed me something over here as well. Now, to a certain extent, we can stand and look at this and say, but Esau didn't deserve this blessing. Esau didn't deserve a blessing, because why should he get a blessing? At the end of the day, how was he serving? He served his father, but was he really serving in the line of the inheritance that was to come down? Now, when we look and we see that the blessing that was given was the blessing of wealth and prosperity. And this is really what 
Abba would have given Jacob anyway. Jacob's going to work, walk in the blessing of prosperity. And at the end of the day, so he's going to... to uh, um, uh, Esau is going to walk in the same blessing anyway. But when we look, Jacob did not deceive his brother into giving up his birthright. Esau gave it away willingly. That is why Abba hated him. Because he gave away his birthright. And that was in Genesis chapter 25. So if we just look at Genesis chapter 25 from verses 34. So if we look at verse 32 and Esau said, Look, I am going to die, so why should I have a birthright? So understand, Jacob says to him, Sell me your birthright today. And Esau said, Look, I'm going to die. So why should I have a birthright? See, yeah, he despises his birthright. There's a difference. He didn't have to despise it. He's now looking with the eye of the flesh and saying, I'm going to die anyway, so let me just give away my birthright. Then Jacob said, swear to me today. And he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob then gave Esau bread, and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank, and rose up and left. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, when I went to have a look at a birthright inheritance, we need to see what does a birthright inheritance entail? What, what does it entail? The birthright inherit, uh, inheritance has to do with both position an inheritance. By birthright, the firstborn son inherited the leadership of the family and the judicial authority of his father. So, understand, Jacob has already received the inheritance that came from his father by receiving his brother's birthright. And his brother has sworn it, which means Jacob has already received it. So even if Jacob, even if Esau is going to bless the firstborn son, he's already given away the inheritance. He's already given it away. Do you understand? Then if we look at Deuteronomy 21 verses 17... Let's just quickly go look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 21 verse 17 says, But he is to acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is, be, he is beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So understand, Father has already done what needed to be done. He already made sure that Esau gave the birthright to Jacob without Jacob having to deceive his brother. He gave it because Esau willingly gave it away. Which means in Deuteronomy 21.17 states that he also is entitled to the double portion of the paternal inheritance. He would receive double portion as much as the other son and he would be head of the family. Jacob desired the birthright because it was more than material wealth. It, was, it had to do with the benefits of being able to be the head of his family to be able to pass down the inheritance based on the ways of Yahuwah and the responsibilities that came with that. Jacob knew his brother was not interested in the things of Yahuwah. It was a waste of time for him. So Jacob knew this. So when Jacob presented this to Esau, Esau willingly gave it away. So therefore Esau has already nullified the rights of the birthright. He's already sworn to his brother to say, I give it away. So did it really make a difference, the fact that Isaac was to bless him? Because at the end of the day, father's already spoken. So why did Rebekah have to fear? 
Why did Rebecca have to fear the fact that if he declares this over, over the son, the elder son, that Jacob is not going to walk in it? Esau has already despised his birthright. Esau has already made the way of going the way of the flesh. Jacob would eventually leave to go and get himself a wife from his uh, um, uncle, bring her back and would have been able to live in harmony and peace the rest of his days. Just like Isaac had received Rebecca when, um, when um, the servant went, um, went ahead, Eliezer, went ahead to go find a wife for Isaac. Jacob could have gone to his uncle, gone and taken a wife and brought her back to his father's house and stayed in his father's house and walked out his inheritance. But this is not what we see. And so that's why I'm saying there's two ways of looking at this. We can see it that the father has, has allowed it. But we must understand that Esau has already despised his birthright. So maybe the father allowed it so that he doesn't even get his inheritance, he doesn't even get his blessing either because he already despised his birthright. So at the end of the day, Isaac was in his flesh and not understanding that he was to be able to give the blessing. But you know, the father could have used him. And it's interesting because as we're going to look further on, further on in weeks ahead, we are going to understand that when it's going to come to the sons of Joseph, and now there's going to be the older Manasseh, and there's going to be the younger Ephraim, and he says, Father, bless the older. Yari's Manasseh, he's the older, and he puts his hand, his right hand, on the younger, and he puts his left hand on the older and he says no father this is the older and this one is the younger and he says he too will receive a blessing but the blessing is going to go through the younger don't you think that the father would have been able to intervene and done it his way but you see you see how we step in man steps in man is the one who steps in so we see that now that Jacob, Esau, is going to serve Jacob. And Jacob has in any way received the, the birthright inheritance, which means he's going to walk as being the one who's going to get the birthright inheritance from his father to be the one who's going to take over the inheritance of the father's house to be able to lead the family in the ways of Abba Yehuah. And that is what we see unfolding here. And so Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, O my father? And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. You see, there is going to be many that are going to have the gnashing of the teeth and weeping. And, and when I looked at this, the father brought me another scenario. And I'm going to bring you a scenario of this in a different form that I want you to understand today of what's going on of here. Because you see, Jacob wanted to dwell in the courts of the father. Jacob was a man that was seeking after Abba Yahuwah. Jacob was a righteous man. He was a man that was perfect in stature, in abiding in the ways of Abba Yahuwah in keeping his Torah, in keeping his charge. Now, isn't this, this Esau that is begging the father for a blessing, doesn't this go to represent many in these last days, many right now that come to the father only for his blessing? 
He didn't want anything to do with the inheritance. He didn't want anything to do with being able to walk in the footsteps of his father, in having to build altars for the father, in having to be able to worship him, in having to be able to sacrifice for him. He wanted to be a wild man hunting in the field. How many call themselves believers, children of the Most High, but all they know how to do is come before the father and rub rub him like a genie in a bottle so that all they can do is get his blessing. I want the blessing. I want the blessing. I want you to bless me, Father. I want you to bless me. But what has he done in order to truly serve the Father? What has he done in order to truly follow after the Father? And so many are going to come in that day and they're going to say, but Yahuwah, we cast out demons in your name. We, 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 prophesied in your name. We did almighty works in your name. And he says, depart from me, you children of iniquity. I do not know you. You practice lawlessness. Because at the end of the day, when you are going to want to come and receive the blessing, the blessing is not going to be there for you. Because you did not behave as one that was a true child of Abba Yahuwah. You might have taken on his name. You might have taken on his son. But at the end of the day, in your character, and in your ways, you did not show yourself as a child who truly served him. And this is how the father showed me and he said, many are going to be like it's going to be Esau that's going to come and say, but father, I am the one that is the oldest son. I am your pastor. I am your prophet. I am your preacher. I am your teacher. And now I need you to be able to bless me so that I may come into the kingdom. And he's going to say, I do not know you. I only have one blessing. And the one who is zealous for me is the one who's going to receive the blessing. The one who chased after me. The one who was willing to come after me. The one who was willing to lay down his life for me. The one who was willing to dwell in my courts. The one who was willing to allow me to be able to put them through the fire and, and, and sanctify them, their hearts and crucify their flesh is the one that is going to truly serve me. Now understand something. We are going to see, just like Abraham, we are going to see, just like Isaac, that we are seeing now, Jacob is not perfect either. But the father still sees the heart of this man. That this man was, let's not forget, he was perfect. That's what was said of him. That's what we read, what was said of him in chapter 26 where it says, um, in chapter, sorry, chapter 25, when it says, and the boys grew up, chapter 25, verses 27, and the boys grew up, and Esau became a man knowing how to hunt. He re represents the ways of the flesh. And a man of the field, he lusts after those things. You see, remember, they had the sheep, they had the goats. He didn't have to go and chase wild animals. But he wanted to be a wild he wanted to be in the world and chase after the things of the world. But Jacob was a complete man dwelling in the tents. And so we must understand this is what the Father has spoken of Jacob. And that complete man is perfect, one who lacks nothing, physical strength, beauty, morally innocent, having integrity, one who is morally and ethically pure, undefiled and upright. This is what Jacob was. But now he listened to his mother. And because he loved his mother, he obeyed his mother even though he was saying to her, but mother, what if this? And what if this? And she said, you do what I say. And he listens to his mother. You see, who are we going to listen to? Who are we going to listen to? Apart to listening to Abba Yahuwah. But I'm painting you a picture here for you to understand the end time because everything of what is in this Bible is going to be as an example for us for end times. Esau is coming, but this man can be weeping before his father and he's saying, my son, I don't have a blessing for you. You are going to be outside. You are going to serve your, your brother. Because at the end of the day, your brother was zealous enough to want to be, want that inheritance. He already got that inheritance from you. You already 
despised it and gave it away at the end of the day. You already despised it. You gave it away willingly. He didn't deceive you for that. He tricked you. He, he put a fleece. He said to you, this is what you can do. Give it to me and I'll give you this. You had a choice to make and say, no, I will not do that. You see, there's choices. We all have choices in this life. We all have choices to be able to make. And this is what we must understand. We have choices. And our choices is going to cost us. If we're going to sow to the flesh, we will reap of the flesh. Now, Esau already had a choice. And he sowed to his flesh. And now, he's losing his inheritance. He's losing his blessing because he's already given away his inheritance. And so he says, what then shall I do for you? Verses 37. And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, bless me too, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And, his, and Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, see, your dwelling is of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heavens from above. So he's telling him, your dwelling is of the fatness of the earth. That's what he also said to the other one. He said it. A lure will give you the dew of the earth and the fatness of the earth. The fatness, the dew of the heavens and the fatness of the earth and the plenty of grain and wine. See, your dwelling is of the fatness of the earth and the dew of the heavens from above. And by your sword. See, this is the same thing as what is going to be. What was also spoken of Ishmael that he was going to be able to be one that was going to live by the sword. And listen to what he says. Your sword, you are, and by your sword, you are to live. But isn't that the choice that he made? He was a hunter. He was living by the bow to hunt. By your sword, you are to live and serve your brother. And it shall be when you grow restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. <clears throat> now, interesting. Because still today, there is a, a big um, feud between the Edomites that became the thorn in the flesh of the Israelites. And still today, you have those that are coming up against Israel. Israel has got a small little piece of land and even their enemies are still trying to take them out. And it says, in the words of Esau, her older son was reported to Rivka. Oh, no, then he says in verse, verse 41, and Esau hated Yaakov because of the blessing. Now you see, this is another thing. Now he hates his brother. We are not to hate anybody in our heart. Hate is as murder. You see, that's exactly what happened with um, Cain and Abel. Abel hated his brother because he was jealous that the father accepted his um, sacrifice and not his. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father draw near, then I'm going to kill my brother Yaakov. And the words of Esau, her older son, were reported to Rivka, and she sent and called Yaakov, her younger son, and said to him, see your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you to kill you. And now, my son, listen to my voice and rise. Flee to my brother Laban in Haran and stay there with him a few days until your brother's wrath turns away, until your brother's displeasure turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. And I shall send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved for you both in one day? Now, understand, did it just, was it just a few days? Was it just a few days that um, Jacob went away? Oh my goodness, Jacob had to work seven years for uh, which he thought he's going to marry Rachel. Instead, goes and marries Leah. Then he's got to work another seven years for Rachel, whom he loved, whom he wanted to marry, another 14 years. And then he continues to work more for him to be able to gather wealth because Laban keeps stealing from him. So you see, at the end of the day, the same deception that was, that was done to him is the same deception that's going to follow him eventually. And now, 
she, he's not going to go for a few days. He's going to go for many years. And Rivka said to Yitzhak, I am disgusted with my life. Now you see, now she's disgusted with my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Yaakov takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these, who are the daughters of the land? What is my life to me? So, the biggest problem that Rivka had was she did not want Esau to have taken these wives from the Hittites. He went and took two wives from the people of the land, the Hittites. And he had the opportunity that he could have gone and got a wife from her family. He had two daughters, Laban. He, she, he could have gone and got one of them. But instead, he was a man of the flesh. He wanted his gratification now. He wanted his desires to be fulfilled now. So he took the wives from the people of the land, which the father never wanted for an inheritance. So here we see again, which the father said, two nations are being separated. Two peoples are going to be separated. And so we see how the story unfolds. And like I said, there's many ways of us being able to look into this. And we see only from what has happened what comes from it ahead. Constantly deception. Constantly deception. Eventually, Jacob is even going to be deceived by his own children to say that Joseph has been killed. And how long is he going to go without Jacob, without Joseph? Again, another deception in his life. So many things that happens to Jacob because of the fact that he bowed to his mother and for what his mother wanted to do when he was already going to walk in the inheritance. So this is what we need to understand today. When the father speaks a promise, father will make it come to pass. Don't you go and make it come to pass because that which you sow of your own flesh to raise yourself up or to do whatever it is according to the prophetic word will be to your detriment in the end and it will be a thorn in your flesh. Let us pray. Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you. What lessons, Father, we can learn. What lessons we learn from this Torah, Father. What lessons we learn from the foundations of your book, of your scriptures, of your writings, of your foundational covenant for us to be able to understand the days ahead. There will be a people group that are going to be the separation between an Esau people group and a Jacob people group, an Esau people group that just wants a blessing but doesn't want to be able to walk out your plan, your ways, but yet all they know to do is to come to you to be blessed. You just have to bless them. But man, they are not willing to lay down their lives, to crucify their flesh, to be able to lay their lives down on an altar. They do not want to dwell in your courts. They do not want to be able to become like you or look like you or have you dwell in them. But all they require and all they desire is a blessing because they want to be rich, because they want the blessing of what you must give them. But they're not willing to do anything for that blessing. And then at the same time, you are not a man that you should lie. You are not a man that needs to use deceptive things in order to have your way. Your ways are righteous. Your ways are upright. You do not need to use deceptive things in order to forward your means. You will do what you need to do in your way. And so I praise and I thank you, Father, for the lessons that you teach us through the pages of your word. Because your word is the foundations that we need to build our lives on. 
And these are not just stories, but they're life lessons. That's why they are instructions for set-apart living, so that we may learn from their mistakes and don't make the same mistakes. Because if we are going to be able to sow to our flesh, it's going to cost us in the long run. And so at the end of the day, the way we treat others will come back to haunt us in the end. And that which we do, if we sow to our flesh, it's going to come back to haunt us in the end. And so I thank you, Father. I thank you for a mighty lesson and for what you are teaching us through these lessons, Father. I thank you that we are learning foundational truths that can shape us and mold us to become the men and women of Yahuwah that you have created us to be. I praise and I thank you for this in Yahushua's name. Amen.